So good afternoon, thank you for coming to the session. So I'm Nick Hawkins, I'm the Senior Director for Product Management for Akamai's Enterprise Security Product Line. I'm based in Singapore and it's great to be here in Delhi talking to all of you. What we're gonna cover in this session, as was outlined in the introduction, I'm gonna start with looking at your perimeter when it comes to security and how can the internet and the cloud assist you when you're looking at next generation security architectures. As we then go through the session and our partners at Nulcon will come up and they'll talk more about the specifics around how that relates to IoT, how you add hardware, how you manage the security from an IoT perspective. And why do we think it's important that you have both the hardware piece and also you look at where the cloud can add value from a security perspective? But the reality is that organizations, certainly from the perspective that we see in Akamai, are turning inside out. We used to think of organizations and networks and devices really being behind a traditional physical perimeter. That would be your firewall, it would be inside your network. But if you look at organizations today, that, all, that model has really been completely turned on its head. If you look at it from an employee perspective, everybody's using mobile devices, they're on the road, and they expect to be able to access all their business applications irrespective of location. If you look at where your applications reside, whether they're business applications, whether that's data collection from IoT, that very often is going to be sat in a cloud compute pl platform somewhere, whether it's from Azure, from Amazon, Google, or whoever. And of course, in many cases, organizations are also taking advantage of SaaS applications. So you have all of these different dimensions that are evolving in your organization. And what we find is the more that you start to open up your organization, the more you start to have this extended reach, the more potential attack vectors you could be opening up from a security perspective. You create new attack surfaces. So we really see that perimeter security whether that's for users, whether that's for devices, whether that's for applications, it's really got to evolve. And it's got to evolve beyond this sort of traditional trusted perimeter model. In the old days, we used to have firewalls. For applications and users, we'd have VPNs, and everything sat behind the firewall except maybe your connection to the internet. But as we've already described, this is now changing. The users are outside your traditional perimeter. And these could be users in terms of business users looking at applications. This could be users in terms of devices needing to connect to a data collection point from an IoT perspective. Devices are distributed, users are distributed, yet traditionally your, your security would be centralized. And as I have mentioned, your applications are moving outside of that perimeter, whether they're SaaS applications, whether it's data gathering in, in cloud compute platforms. And if you're relying on end users to connect to those applications, the last thing you want to have to give them is a different configuration and setup, depending on whether they're connecting to SaaS, whether they're connecting to traditional business applications, etc. The other big challenge, I think, is that threats are moving inside your network. We've seen this already in many, many different ways. Whether it's people targeting your business applications, not just your web applications. Web applications have been under attack for a long time. That's why you have cloud application firewalls and other tools that are there to protect your public web properties, your public media properties. That's certainly a business that Akamai has been in for a long time. But we're seeing threats move behind the firewall now. Whether it's cleverly crafted phishing emails that are configured to do web attack injections on your internal applications whether it's the danger of your IoT devices being taken over through malicious code. We saw that recently with the Mirai botnet, 650 gigabits of traffic being driven by malicious takeover of IoT devices. In that case, it was mainly network connected um, video surveillance devices. So again, these threats that is, used to be on the outside of your network coming in, they're now getting inside your network. You need tools and capabilities to be able to detect those threats, to be able to identify them, to give you early warning that maybe there are suspicious traffic patterns running on your network, whether those traffic patterns are coming from devices or from users. 
And the reality is, I think, that those traditional perimeters that you would set up to provide that data, provide that information, are becoming more and more complex. Whether you're looking at segmenting application delivery, whether you're looking, if it's a user-based environment, to integrate identity, if you're looking at maybe inspecting traffic to look for anomalous patterns if an IoT device has been compromised. So really the reality is you have to start looking to the cloud more to give you an, an ability to give you comprehensive security, consistent security across all your situations and environments. There's a term that we're starting to see being used in a lot of organizations now, which is zero trust. Zero trust is really an evolution of the traditional way of thinking about a network perimeter. In the past, a network perimeter was a trusted edge. You verified any device, any communication coming into your perimeter, but once that communication was within your walls, if you like, inside the walls of the castle, then that was able to communicate fairly freely. <coughs> in a zero trust environment, you turn that on its head. What you do in a zero trust is you might take the assumption that there is no inside. There is no concept of your IoT device talking to a data collection server that is behind your firewall. So the only thing you need to worry about is how do you get that traffic through your firewall. In a zero trust environment, you assume that all traffic is never trusted. You verify and identify that device and that traffic for every communication. That way you can now start to break down the perimeters and look at putting that security in the cloud rather than having to replicate it at every possible um, attack point or exposure point where your network connects to the internet or where your devices connect to the internet. So this term zero trust, it was pioneered by, by one of the industry analysts in Forrester. And I say the key things, the key tenants, if you like, of zero trust is you don't make any distinction between between behind the firewall and outside the firewall. And I think this plays very well, certainly into the IoT space, where your devices, in some cases, could be behind a managed network perimeter. In other cases, they could be publicly accessible on the internet, and you need to, to protect those. You also never trust any traffic. There's no such thing now as trusted traffic, for example, running inside a VPN or another similar tunnel. And of course, it goes without saying that you always verify behavior with logging. You want behavioral analytics to spot anomalies and patterns. And basically, you always, as I say, always verify and you never trust. There is a lot more reading on, on this topic. Um, that there's a, a book by O'Reilly. There's various research articles. And what you'll also find is some industry analysts have different terms for similar concepts. Some will talk about the elastic perimeter or the cloud perimeter. There's also an interesting piece of research by Google. Google have taken a zero trust approach for their internal business application environments. Their target is to enable every user to work without a VPN and have access to the applications that they should be allowed access to and only those applications. So really an identity driven authentication mechanism for application access. So I say, certainly some interesting additional reading matter. And in the presentation, I have links to some of these, these documents if you do want to dive further in, into the topic. But the key reason organizations are starting to look at cloud perimeters now is because it simplifies your network security. And it potentially reduces your risk. You move your initial attack surface away from your physical network perimeter, and you put it into the cloud. This allows you to do a number of different things that bring benefits. Depending on whether you're looking at user um, identification or device identification, you can start to do integrated identity management to validate traffic that's coming in and out of your network. You can use the power of big data and analytics to spot malicious patterns of activity that you might not otherwise see when it's running on your organization. You can do data inspection, you can do payload analysis, and you can obviously monitor and track everything that's happening on your network. At Akamai, we see that this concept of a cloud perimeter and taking the zero trust model, you really need to split it into sort of two halves. First of all, you need to look at inbound control. And that's users or machines or information that is outside of your network that needs to get into your application server environments. 
That could be an IoT device that is trying to deliver data. It could be a cloud service that you're using where you want to ingest logs into your, your SIEM security management system. It could be users trying to get access to business applications. You really need to ensure that you've got a consistent, repeatable, enforceable method of access. If you're looking at using a cloud perimeter, certainly for user access, you want an integrated identity-driven approach. That way you can enforce application access on a need-to-know basis. Why should an individual or a device have access to the financial servers, the um, human resources servers, if their business is maybe order management or is maybe um, doing stock control? So it's about ensuring that you implement a need-to-know basis really for all your users, your applications, and access to those systems. And that really is, is building the concept, as I say, as we call the zero trust within, within your cloud perimeter. But you also need to look at outbound traffic. And again, that traffic could be information logging going to a data collection point on the internet. It could be users simply looking to get access to business applications or internet-based data. Very often, outbound traffic is trusted because it's behind the network firewall. Therefore, that traffic is not logged, it's not inspected. Imagine if you've got a network of sensors running inside your business organization, maybe in your factory, in your warehouse, and those devices get compromised. How do you identify that they're not being used maliciously, maybe as an example of a, a denial of service botnet as we've seen in the past? If you're just looking at your data that's coming from your devices, and maybe you're not inspecting some of the outbound traffic, you'd never know that maybe those devices inside your network have been compromised. So you really want to ensure that if you are implementing and checking your outbound traffic, that you can have a consistent policy irrespective of those devices where they are on your network or even off your network. If there are threats that are happening, if devices have been compromised, you want to identify that as early as possible and stop those threats and stop your network from being exploited as early as possible in the development of what we call the kill chain of, of malware that might be infecting your network. And clearly, it needs to adapt rapidly to emerging threats. One thing that's very, very clear is that the malicious actors, the people who write the malware, these are very smart people. They are very, very capable in understanding how to exploit user behavior in terms of phishing, to exploit vulnerabilities in operating systems and network design, to exploit weak password control in IoT devices. And they will exploit these and adapt their techniques to avoid traditional firewalls, traditional blacklists and signature tools that are used to really prevent the kind of attacks that, that they want to create on, on your network. So again, when you start to look to the cloud, you can take advantage of big data, you can take advantage of machine learning, you can take advantage of the power of the crowd, and when other people are maybe suffering and then find a solution, again, you can potentially benefit from that in your organization. So that's kind of how we see that the cloud perimeter and, and looking at the sort of the key tenants really of, of implementing both inbound and outbound control across your, your environment. Certainly from the Akamai perspective, uh, we're very, very active, as you might expect, in, in the cloud environment. And for us, a cloud perimeter, perimeter really, we can sum up in three distinct statements. First of all, it's about that access. How do you control both inbound and outbound access and ensure that that access is only being approved and enabled for authorized users, authorized devices, and how do you validate and ensure authentication for that communication? How do you then leverage the power of the cloud to proactively mitigate issues that could be attacking your network? That could be an infected IoT device, it could be a user device that's infected with malware that's communicating out to a command and control server. And then as you're also seeing more and more um, communication migrating away from a traditional trusted network, an internal network, an MPLS type network, and now using the internet for business communication, Again, whether that's business applications or whether that's IoT communication, how do you ensure that performance is adequate? How do you look at either offloading the perimeter for data gathering? How do you look at ensuring that that data is securely being communicated and delivered? Now, I'm not sure those of you who are that familiar with Akamai, 
Um, you might question, well, why is this guy, Nick, from Akamai, you know, what gives him the right to stand up and talk about the cloud perimeter in the front of you? So really just one slide on who Akamai is, really, to establish a little bit of credibility. Uh, we are a global organization. We run the world's largest content delivery and media delivery network across the globe. We have a global platform of over 240,000 servers in 1,600 networks, 750 cities, 130 countries. We basically carry about one third of the world's internet traffic when it comes to a content delivery perspective, over 130,000 different domains. I mean, you can see the kind of large scale statistics that we have there. The reason I put this up is just so that um, I think when it comes to looking at how do you use the internet and secure your traffic on the internet, how do you manage performance across the internet, that's something that Akamai has been doing for nearly the last 20 years. That is our core business. So I think it puts us in quite a good position to be able to go with you on that journey as you look to see how you manage the, the cloud perimeter, how you manage the internet perimeter to help you in terms of your IoT network design, your business and user application design. So first of all, looking at the, the inbound control. So imagine you've got data collection servers. You need to be able to get information from IoT devices, or maybe you're only looking to enable users to access your applications. I mean, what you see there, I think, is a fairly typical and traditional network design, whether it's a private data center or it's a cloud compute environment. You've got a bunch of boxes, a bunch of functionality, whether it's load balancing, whether it's multi-factor authentication, identity integration, all of these things that you use to put barriers in place for your communication coming into your network. You need to identify the traffic, you need to segment the traffic, you need to control the traffic. But we believe that this architecture is really fundamentally flawed because the traffic that's trying to get to your servers from outside the network in, it means you have to have a firewall hole, uh, have to have a hole in your firewall open. Therefore, you've got a fundamental attack surface already exposed. Not to mention the cost and the complexity of trying to both manage this environment, ensure consistency between different data center environments. We believe that when you start to move to the cloud perimeter, you look at a zero trust model, there is a better way of doing this. And the concept is fairly simple. You take those core technologies that would traditionally sit in your data center, and you move those technologies into a cloud-based environment. Effectively, you look at providing the identity management, the access control, the load balancing, the additional authentication, and you deliver that from the cloud. The cloud now becomes your first line of defense. If you do it in such a way that you have effectively a proxy environment sat in your data center, that proxy makes the communications up to the platform. This means you can close the hole on your firewall. Zero attack surface in terms of inbound traffic. The user or the device that needs to communicate to your application environments, they need to transmit data, need to interact with applications. No longer are they tunneling through your, into your network. No longer are they creating a VPN environment or maybe given access on a specific port through your firewall. They're now communicating through the platform as well. So you've done a couple of key things here. You've managed to close the firewall, so the traffic is only outbound in terms of the communication sessions coming from your data center. And the user or the device that's connecting in is not connecting directly to your data center. The cloud is now managing that communication and effectively proxying the information between the two environments. All managed from the cloud as a single environment. You're not now managing multiple boxes in multiple locations. You can apply consistency irrespective of whether your data center is in the cloud compute environment or it's a private data center. And you've improved your security and your segmentation. The communication from the user could be browser-based, so it's all port 80 or port 443. And because you've got application segmentation now controlled by the proxy that's in the data center, there's no lateral movement. There's no spread between applications. Bottom line, it's simpler to deploy. Oh, Please, question. How does the help the downbound communication for ACP? Sorry, could you repeat the question? How it is going to help for outbound communication? So the question is, how does this help from outbound only? 
So the key thing here with the proxy is the proxy is creating SSL-based sessions to the cloud, to specific locations on the platform, for example, in the Akamai platform environment. So this means that you can completely close the inbound traffic to your firewall. The, set, the sessions... The sessions will be communicated by the device, the proxy server that sits within the data center environment, and those sessions are effectively waiting for inbound traffic communication. So this means that you have to have no ports open on your firewall. How it is going to put a benefit if today is all API based communication, where the application is talking to whether it is a communication it's initiating from an internal system or communication is coming from outside, it is communicating over a trusted network. So How the trust zone is, 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 has been established between two parties. After that, what communicates within the, how does it matter? How protocol wise, how does it matter? So, so there's, a, there's a couple of pieces to, to your comments and your question. So with most of the communication being API based, um, you're obviously you're making an assumption that the API communication itself is, is sufficiently trusted. If it's running over a trusted network, if it's behind, say, the firewall and it's not an MPLS environment, then yes, that's a completely closed environment. Certainly what we're hearing from a lot of customers is that the cost and complexity of maintaining that private and trusted network is, is one where they, they're finding that quite prohibitive these days. So what we're finding some customers want to do is they want to try and achieve the same level of, should we say, security and comfort that you would get knowing that everything is, is trusted and running behind your firewall on your, on your trusted network. They want to achieve that same level of security but do it using the internet as a communication-based mechanism because that can potentially give them obviously significant cost savings. They don't want to migrate to that unless they have the confidence that the communication between the um, devices and the servers, the API communication, et cetera, can be done in a trusted manner. So it, it's this, one of the key things here is, yes, is application-specific access. So if you've got a device that needs to communicate to a server, it can only get to that server. So it has no visibility or no connectivity to any other device. Okay. So really it's about having simplified communication. It's making it easier to roll out um, from a, a cloud-based perspective. As we mentioned already, it's about outbound communication from your, um, and ensuring that you can close the inbound communication on your firewall. So the only communications from your data center are outbound. And it gives you the opportunity, because you're now going across the internet, to add other cloud-based protection solutions, such as DDoS mitigation, web application firewall. So it really allows you to click to build up multiple layers of trust. Because again, you're terminating that initial session that's coming in from the device or the user on the cloud platform, first thing you can do is, is check for certificate validation. Does that device, does that user have a trusted client certificate? If it doesn't, then I drop that communication at the cloud perimeter. That never even gets close to communicating to your API server or whatever it might be. Secondly, does that device, does that user have to authenticate and validate themselves? So again, username and password. So now my first layer of validation is, is that device itself trusted? Second layer of validation is, is that device authenticating and proving itself as a username and a password? Now, if it's an individual, if you're looking more at an application protection for user-based apps, you also have the opportunity of actually validating the identity of the user with things like multi-factor authentication. So again, validating that a username and password have not been compromised. Obviously, in a device-driven scenario, that one's probably a less applicable. But at least it gives you the opportunity to have these multiple layers of ver verification and authentication. And then based on that authentication, determines exactly which applications you see and get access to. So if I'm an API-based device trying to communicate to a, an API server, once I've gone through the authentication for certificate, for username and password, the only path that I'm ever allowed to communicate to is that backend API server that I'm allocated to. I can't see, communicate with, or don't even know it exists any other application server environment.
So let me show you what this, this means from a, so we say, an experience perspective. I'm actually going to, because it would be hard to show this from an IoT device perspective, I'm going to show it from a user application perspective. But I think the environments, the, the user experience, I think, is, is, still, is still relatable. So what we have here is we have a sample application environment that is front-ended by Akamai's um, implementation of the cloud perimeter for secure application access. All the communication from me as a user or a device is simply through port 80 or port 443, in this case port 443. And I log in as a user, so the first thing I'm doing, I'm being authenticated. Do I have a valid certificate on my machine? If I don't, I won't be able to even log in. I do have a valid certificate on my machine. My machine, I have a valid username and password. So now I can actually log into the environment. I can see here a sample set of applications that I am able to communicate with. In this particular demo environment, they're, they're a mixture of web and traditional business applications. But anything really that's running over SSH, RDP, or uh, web communication is, is supported in this environment. The key thing here is, I only see these five applications because that's all my access is authorized to communicate with. If my colleague Bruno was to log in, he has different access rights. He may see some of the same application environments. He may see completely different environments. The key thing here is it's identity-based decision making and that identity determines what you can communicate with. So in the example here, I can simply click, I can connect to SharePoint. I'm connecting to SharePoint, it's a web-based communication. This server is behind the firewall. I am at no point in any way connected to the data center where this is running. Same environment is say I want to communicate an RDP session or maybe an SSH session. Again, it's all being done from my device, it's being done in the browser. The communication is completely secure. At no point are we opening any RDP ports, no port 3389 to go inbound into the, the firewall environment. Again, just as another quick example, you can see SSH communication. So again, all being delivered safely and securely, securely all being done through allowing you to close off your firewall ports, but probably most importantly, segmenting your communication streams without having to worry about detailed firewall segmentation, virtual LAN environments, I've immediately enabled the opportunity to partition your access to your application environments, your application servers, based on identity. It's a very, very simple but secure way of improving the security in your environment and giving you network segmentation. So we've talked a little bit about the, the inbound control. How do you create this clientless application specific access? But what about the outbound communication? How do you look at ensuring you've got sufficient and suitable protections for outbound communication from your network environment? Again, one thing that certainly we see at Akamai is that traditional perimeter security architectures for outbound traffic need to evolve. The threats that are out there, the compromises, the takeovers that we see of devices are getting more and more sophisticated. And you can never have one such thing as 100% completely secure protection. The smart organizations today really look at a defense in depth environment. Yes, you will need firewall protection. If you're looking at user-based devices, you would still want antivirus, your traditional tools on your laptop. But what else can you do to help protect against the emerging threats? In the past, as a network operator, you network admin, all you cared about was protecting your servers and connect, credit, protecting your user devices. But now, with everything having an IP address and a network port, you have to worry about protecting everything that's within your environment, all of those I, IoT devices, as well as the traditional environments. And the targeted threats are becoming ever, ever smarter. Again, I mentioned the Mirai botnet attack. Who would have thought a couple of years ago that you know, the concept of somebody taking over millions of devices on the internet that are basically video surveillance devices and using that to create 650 gigabits of threat or denial of service traffic, it would have been unthinkable. 
but it is the reality now. Certainly when you look at a, at a business organization perspective, over half of the data breaches that we saw last year were driven by malware rather than human behavior. It was some piece of sophisticated software that had got on the network, was spreading through the network, was extracting data. And I was shocked when I came across this statistic. Over 12 million new malicious programs are registered every month by the AV test organization. That's nearly 400,000 malicious programs a day. Now often in this case, it's malware that has been identified, but then the malware writer evolves it, repackages it, recreates it, because they want to avoid detection by firewalls, they want to avoid detection by more traditional signature-based environments. And the reality is that the majority of threats both come from and connect to the internet. One of the, I think, most misunderstood or um, least looked at and investigated environment in any network communication is where DNS fits into the overall communication chain. Over 90% of known threats use DNS for communication to malware servers, command and control servers, update servers, etc. And what we've seen is that in the past, DNS was never inspected. Now, organizations and tools are available to start giving you some DNS level of inspection, but guess what? The malware writers become more sophisticated. They evolve new techniques using algorithmic-based generation of domains, using dynamically changing IP addresses and name servers with things like fast flux. Or they use DNS itself as a way of drip feeding data out of your network. So we see that there's really an opportunity here to provide an extra level of protection, again, from the cloud, being able to spot algorithmically and block communication from malware, from infected IoT devices, because they're having to communicate out on the internet. And DNS is a great tool to enable that. We see an architecture where if you move your DNS resolver from being behind your firewall to actually being up in the cloud, it gives you a number of benefits. First, you can take advantage not just of a static blacklist and a signature-based detection, but you can have dynamic cloud-based security intelligence powering your threat decisions, determining what should be blocked, what should be allowed. You can implement capabilities on devices that are off your network. So certainly if you're looking at um, user-based devices such as laptops, you can enforce consistent policies when users are traveling. But probably most importantly, if you're using a cloud-based environment, you can use that cloud-based environment to log data and apply algorithms to look at it algorithmically over a period of time, over historical data. So some of these techniques that I mentioned before, if you take a snapshot of DNS data, you would never know that there is potentially anything malicious happening on your network. But if you start um, pointing your DNS through to a cloud-based environment, that cloud-based environment can apply pattern matching, machine learning, um, and detection techniques to look back over seven days of data, two weeks of data, and spot the use of these kind of techniques. And why is that important? Again, think of it from an IoT perspective. If you have a device, and for some reason that device has been compromised, then how do you know that it's not sending data out of your network to somewhere it shouldn't be? How do you spot that maybe it's being used in a DDoS attack and is being used to generate denial of service traffic? If you're not inspecting your DNS, you may not be able to identify that. And even if you do filter your DNS and, and do some inspection of it, the chances are that those techniques will avoid being detected because you're not applying machine learning and big data. So really a very powerful use of a cloud perimeter to give you extra layers of protection and security over and above the uh, security you would expect from, from IoT devices themselves. So it's really all about ensuring that you've got visibility. It's ensuring you've got control. Because once you have visibility and control, then you've basically you've got the, the foundation to start implementing security. So let me show you what that looks like from, from an administrator's experience. Again, I've got a, an Akamai test environment set up here. Give me a second, let me get my mouse to come across. Where is it? There we go. 
So this is an Akamai cloud perimeter for DNS threat-based detection. I won't take you through the configuration, the setup, but it's fairly simple. You point your traffic, in this case, to Akamai. Akamai will then be your DNS resolver. But most importantly, we will log the traffic, we will analyze it, we will run algorithmic analysis on it. So very quickly, you start to get a view of what's happening on your network. You can look in your DNS environment and see all the traffic that is being sent, because everything pretty much these days needs to communicate with DNS. We have some organizations looking at using this for anomalies in IoT communication. We have some organizations looking at wanting to spot shadow IT, what I call credit card IT that's running on the network, cloud services that are being used that maybe are not authorized for use by your particular organization. So by just looking at the DNS itself, I start to get an insight of where my traffic's coming from, the domains that are being accessed, Maybe I want to, I have concerns over acceptable use policies and I want to um, provide some additional controls over blocking access to certain types of data, certain types of sites. But from my dashboard, I can very quickly drill down. We'll take an example, let's take that IoT um, example. Let's say a device has been compromised and typically that device would need to communicate out to a command and control server to get update information, to maybe be um, updated with, with new software that can, can do additional exploits. So I can look here in my thread analysis, and I get a, a really multiple different dimensions of looking at the DNS threat data that might be coming on my network. I could look at the domains that it's going to. We have some test domains that we, that we use here. I can look at the category of threats that are coming on my network. Maybe it's command and control traffic that I'm most concerned about. I can then obviously drill in from a command and control perspective. But you can see here malware, phishing. I have the ability to very quickly identify and understand the traffic that's happening on my network. What I also can do is for any traffic that meets categories of malware, phishing, or command and control, I can implement policies, and those policies could block that traffic, it could alert me. So again, you may not wish to block communication, but you may wish to be alerted when you've got suspected command and control traffic, suspected malware traffic. This could be an early indicator that maybe if you've got an IoT environment, that something in that IoT environment has been compromised. So it's a way of certainly giving you, I think, an early warning mechanism. It's also a way of providing a greater level of control and security really from the cloud uh, in addition to what you might have physically on, on premise in a traditional network perimeter. So I think, you know, a very high level view, but I think you can see just from the dashboard, the level of information that you get is something that if you're not inspecting DNS traffic, you, you really don't have an understanding of, what, of what's happening on your network without going into detail firewall logs and traffic logs. And I would say, going back to the presentation, the, the key difference here, I think, because there are obviously many ways to build a perimeter that will inspect traffic, that will look at this. The key challenge that we see is the traditional network-based approaches, your firewalls, your next-gen firewalls, your uh, security devices, typically work with fairly static-based uh, lists in terms of blacklists, in terms of signature-based detection. And the reality is that can't keep up. The people who write the malware are smart. They are not stupid people. And they're in it for a reason, typically to make money or to be disruptive or both. So you really need a solution that can adapt and evolve rapidly. And again, a cloud-based security intelligence approach where you have a vast treasure trove of data feeding into the decision-making process of what is a bad domain, what is a suspected domain, what is a known good domain. The more data you have going into that, the better the quality of that decision making will be. The more DNS traffic, the more DNS resolutions that, that your cloud security is involved in, the more web-based information that you've got all lead to smarter decisions around, I'm sorry, I've lost the, the mic, all lead to smarter decisions of what is um, good traffic and what, what is not good traffic. I think we're back now. So, that just really just gives you an insight, certainly from an Akamai perspective, of the value that is there in the cloud. 
Now, the next question is, you know, what, what are the next steps? What would you do to move forward to really look at starting to, to embrace a cloud-based perimeter? And first of all, I think look at your communication, look at the organization, look at the problems you're trying to solve, whether that's looking at improving security for your API servers, improving security for your user-based application access. Maybe you want to have a more granular inspection and early detection of your IoT data and communication. So look at where the cloud perimeter can help you. Look at what's important for you in terms of the, the threats that you want to protect against, the things that you want to identify. There are a number of solutions out there. I gave you a quick overview of Akamai Solutions, the Enterprise Application Access and the Threat Protection Solution. These are just examples of how you can use a cloud perimeter to give you more secure inbound control to, say, your application servers, or to give you more outbound control, say, in terms of DNS detection for, for IT devices, for IoT devices. There are a lot of resources out there on the internet. There's a, there's a few examples here, and I think we're certainly we're happy to share the presentation, and you'd be able to uh, look at these links and, and read a little bit more. And certainly what I'd recommend, certainly from an Akamai perspective, is, is to give your network a health check. If you're already running IoT communication, if you already have API traffic running across your network, which you most likely do, start to have a look at what's happening. For example, the Akamai Enterprise Threat Protection Solution, send us your DNS traffic. We're more than happy to give everyone in the room, every organization here, a network health check. Get visibility see what's happening on your network. Once you have visibility, it gives you the opportunity to have control. Once you have control, you can then start to continue to improve and adapt and evolve your security posture. So with that, certainly from my side, I'd just like to thank you all very much for your time. Feel free to reach out and, and connect with me if, if you want to have more discussion on these topics. And I think before we hand over to the next session, I guess we just uh, see if there's any questions in the room. Time for Q&A. There's one at the front here. I think they'll just bring you a microphone. My name is Zaman. So uh, the kind of uh, interface you showed me, like there were common applications that were listed there, like SSH, RDP, or uh, web uh, websites, or like SharePoint. But can it work for uh, other custom applications which are not uh, working on these standard ports? So, so great question. So right now, the, certainly the solution that I just used as a, as a demonstration from Akamai, that's focused on web-based traffic, RDP, and, and SSH. We are looking at how do we evolve that solution to apply and allow support for custom applications and custom ports. We don't have that capability yet, but we're, we're looking at enhancing that, and hopefully we'll, that sort of facility should be available uh, probably in the first half of next year. IoT devices, let's say if uh, my server is sitting behind on, on cloud, but if my sensor is, again, it's on the uh, outside, now when it's communicating, a user may log into your uh, interface and then he can access the server, but a uh, uh, device cannot do that, right? So for them, again, in the we have to open the ports through the firewall before them to come in. Uh, so so one, th one thing that I, I didn't highlight, I showed going in more from a user perspective because it's a little easier from a demonstration perspective, but every one of those server communication points has an independent and separate URL where you can apply the identity and the certificate validation. So if that IoT device is needing to, say, communicate, um, let's say, over port 443, with you know using https put and get for for data communication it could actually go straight it could use the same security mechanism and go straight to the application server so you're not having to actually come in through a portal you can go to an individual dedicated server directly and the way that works is the url itself terminates on the cloud platform but the cloud platform knows that that url is actually com a communication path to the server that sits behind the firewall that will not go th through this solution. So it, right? wouldn't, it would go through the core technology. It just wouldn't go through the user portal. There's two different ways of accessing. And it's just I can't, I, it, you obviously can't demonstrate that sort of straight through communication from a, a demo perspective. And it will, uh, the solution will provide protection for the servers behind it, but not the endpoints or the user endpoints. Like if someone is downloading any malware on the user system or the, like the user systems are being compromised, it cannot protect that. It just protect your servers that are hosted. 
So, so that, that's why we looked at the, the two different parts of the, the protection, the, the inbound control to the servers and then the outbound control to the devices. So the demonstration where I showed the portal, that's very much looking at, yes, protecting your server environments, etc. What we then recommend is that for the device side of protection, that's where you would, for example, do the DNS traffic uh, inspection to maybe block communication to a known malware URL or at least spot if something has been uh, compromised on your network. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just another question. Hello. Hi. Yeah, uh, my name is Vishal here. I have a very simple question over here. Like, uh, how do you inspect the encrypted traffic considering the emerging DDoS solutions? So, in terms of inspecting traffic, uh, it really depends at, at which layer. Are you talking about in terms of the application layer? Application layer attack. So for the, the application layer, um, we're not actually inspecting the traffics. The, the two different pieces to the solution, maybe I should highlight. So when it's talking about protections for, to the server environments, the cloud platform in that environment is really being a conduit. So we're validating that the device has a client certificate, we're validating username and password, but then the HTTPS communication, effectively the API communication, that, that's being passed through to the server. So we're really just enabling the session communication environments. In the outbound security protection, right now we're looking at a DDoS level of protection. To do the deeper level of inspection, you have to rely on a man-in-the-middle uh, certificate-based approach. So you would load a certificate into, for example, in our example, in the Akamai platform, and we would terminate the SSL session and then initiate the outbound SSL session based on that. That's the, the only way that we can do that to be able to allow us to break into the SSL path and to be able to do the payload analysis and inspection to, to ensure that there's nothing malicious coming back in the network. So it is keyless SSL or keyless? It would be, so it would be, you would need a certificate that would be trusted by the device. So typically we would recommend organizations have their, their own certificate signing authority obviously and, and create a certificate that the device that's communicating out will trust. One more question, I think we've got time for. Hi, this is Jatin. Uh, just want to know, is this a INM product or is this a firewall product or is it just combining the best of the features and putting together as an integrated product? Or maybe another way to ask that question is what product are you competing against in the market? Good, good question in terms of where, where do these solutions position themselves? I would say that, r that right now, you know, th there are tools that, for example, a next generation firewall would have that maybe the current cloud-based perimeter solutions don't have, don't have all of those bells and whistles, they don't have all of that functionality. Um, I think in terms of the application access solution, that's very much looking at really removing the need for tunneling, removing the need for VPN type environments, and enabling you to have a simple, secure way of providing access to application servers as, as across the internet. So I would say if you were to put that in a box and say where is it directly competing against, it's really trying to move away from traditional network access solutions like, like VPNs and, and VLAN segmentation for application control. In terms of the outbound traffic inspection, uh, that I would say there's not really many organizations, many solutions out there that do deep levels of DNS inspection right now. Um, so we would position it more as a complementary solution. We, we certainly wouldn't be recommending that, you know, if you look in a user-based environment that you get rid of your antivirus on your laptop or you throw your firewall away. You know, if you're protecting against IoT devices, you're still going to want a firewall to, you know, ensure that you don't have any inbound traffic that, that's unwanted. So we would certainly see that as, as complementing these days. I think what you will see, and this is where I think it'll be interesting with the evolution of the cloud perimeter, is that the tools and techniques that are there today, which I would say are complementary to other aspects of network security, you're certainly going to see the capabilities of the cloud-based solutions grow. And I think then you are going to see at some point in the future a more head-to-head -head comparison in terms of techniques and architectures of whether you go cloud-based or whether you go sort of traditional on-premise perimeter-based. 
uh, you know, hardware type based solutions because I think you are going to see um, an increasing growth in the functionality that will lead to more of a head to head sort of architectural choice. Okay. Yes, sir. Just want to ask, uh, like nowadays, the world is uh, going towards smart cities, and uh, uh, we want to integrate uh, the the energy measuring systems, uh, the protocols which are used for them, mm -hmm. DLSM, COSEN. So, uh, does uh, your products also support them, and the risk involved in them? Because then uh, it will be a question of uh, you know, uh, one error that means bursting entire you know energy, and you know the collapsing the entire power grid. Right, right. I mean, I, I think we, we need to understand your specific requirement, obviously a little a little more. Uh, smart metering, but nowadays. Yeah, I think I think in in terms of smart metering. Because now uh, now there is a research wherein uh, now data uh, can also travel along with the energy, data and energy. And there is this aggregation of data and then energy kind of thing. Th those protocols. I yeah, think. yeah. So, so I, th I are think are they compliant? These products right now. So the, these products, so the solutions we've been talking about, using standard network protocols. So oh. they're they're using standard DNS resolution techniques, standard SSL communication. So if the smart metering solution is using proprietary communication methods and proprietary protocols, then, then right now I would say no, it wouldn't be supported. If they're using more standards-based communication protocols, then, then yes, they could definitely be integrated. And I think what you'd look at doing again in your, the environment you're describing, where clearly it needs to be it's highly sensitive, you're going to want to have multiple layers of defense. So you're going to want to have anomaly detection for your smart meters to ensure that you're confident they're only communicating to a data gathering server farm that, that they're authorized for. You'd want to have application security on your data farm so only authorized smart meters are able to access. So you'd look at building up those, those different layers. Thank you. Okay. okay, so with that, thank you very much for, for your time today. And I think we'll hand over to Asim, I think, that's going to present next from uh, Nolk on, on, on IoT. So again, thanks very much for your time. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you GCCS for giving us the opportunity to uh, talk on IoT security here. Uh, originally, this session was planned as uh, a kind of an informal workshop for about uh, three, three and a half hours, but unfortunately we didn't have so much time, so I had to shrink the presentation to around 45 minutes to one hour of uh, specifics about uh, IoT security. So anyone familiar with this uh, picture? Okay, so this, this photo is taken, uh, so this was a research done by uh, security researcher Charlie Miller uh, and Chris Wallasak. They hacked uh, uh, the Jeep uh, Cherokee uh, car and this was taken when they were actually uh, able to remotely control the car and take it uh, uh, off-road. Yeah, so these kind of bad things can happen. All right, so a little bit about me. I am co-founder and director of research at uh, uh, Pi2 labs and uh, I basically look at uh, IoT security research. Uh, I'm also the co-founder for NULL, uh, the open security community. I think my colleague here later will talk about uh, uh, what NULL exactly is. So basically it's a, a non-profit organization, uh, one of the largest and active security communities in India. So uh, all we do is just share knowledge. We have monthly meetings, workshops, all free. We are not funded by any government or any uh, private companies. Uh, we also organized two security conferences. One is NullCon, which is the name that you saw on the uh, standee outside. This is uh, uh, organized every year in the month of February in Goa. And we have started a conference called Hardware.io, which specifically focuses on hardware security issues. This is organized uh, every year in the month of September in uh, Netherlands. And other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm also an open source uh, developer. I keep contributing uh, security tools, useful and useless. Uh, uh, you can check out my GitHub and Bit Bitbucket. A uh, few of the tools I'm going to be talking about here, which we've specifically made for uh, uh, testing IoT security. 
and I give trainings on uh, uh, how to hack IoT. All right, so the agenda of uh, today's session would be I'm going to talk about uh, what are the IoT security issues, uh, what is the attack surface from a high level, and then we'll drill down into the attack surface and look at what all, what all different things uh, uh, have to be taken care of when you are de deploying or when you are actually coming up with an I uh, IoT product. I am not going to focus uh, much on cloud, as I think Nick has covered most of the cloud part. But what I'm going to focus on is mobile and certainly the, the hardware aspect of it. And then we're going to talk about the problem statement, the trends and issues. Some of the issues that we see uh, are going to come in the future when people are going to start uh, attacking the sensors directly and what are uh, the things that they can achieve from uh, attacking these devices. Uh, and uh, so what next? All right, so uh, what are the uh, issues? So these issues come directly from our engagements with startups and vendors. Uh, one of the challenges that we see is uh, uh, protocol issues, so implementing of protocols. I mean, there are uh, some good protocols, and then there are a lot of upcoming protocols for IoT. So what happens with the uh, developers is that they look at what is you know famous or uh, you know what is there in the market, and try to implement that in their product, uh, which may be helpful uh, to their product or may not be helpful. So uh, the idea is to look at what are the requirements for your sensors, and the communication between the sensor and the cloud or sensor and the mobile, and then come up with the best protocol that suits your uh, specific deployment or uh, product. Uh, second is speed to market. Uh, because there are a lot of uh, startups now coming up with uh, uh, IoT products, there's a lot of innovation happening. I mean, you think about uh, a particular uh, uh, product and it's smart now. So anything and everything. So And the hardware uh, itself, the, uh, the hardware platform itself has become really cheap. So anyone can quickly uh, pick up a development platform and uh, uh, write a good uh, IoT product. Uh, so the problem with that is now, since there are too many players in the market, everybody wants to reach the market faster. And what happens in this uh, uh, timeline is that you have to let go of too many things. So functional testing, security testing, obviously. Uh, and we've seen this in examples of our research when we look at security issues. Some of the issues boil down to people not actually taking care of uh, uh, or not uh, doing sufficient functional and as well as uh, security testing of their products. Low, no motivation for security, well, uh, uh, it could be awareness and uh, uh, it is also possible that uh, you don't have sufficient funding to go ahead and do uh, uh, an assessment because these assessments are fairly little, little costly if, uh, as compared to traditional, you know, just web application uh, penetration testing or network uh, uh, assessment. Uh, the other challenges that we see with, which is not here in the uh, slide, is that people who are actually aware of security issues still have to go with the uh, insecure uh, hardware platforms, given that the, uh, the cost uh, uh, to the user for a particular product uh, outweighs uh, what hardware platform or what specific microcontrollers or chips they can use to have a baseline of, or uh, at least uh, a baseline of uh, encryption implementation on the, on the uh, sensors. So again, a uh, very simple example would be not uh, many vendors of very small sensors, you know, like BLE enabled sensors that you put on your machine would have, uh, uh, or would be okay with implementing high cost uh, microcontrollers that have, uh, 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 keys embedded within uh, uh, the chip itself. So then they resort to uh, other uh, methods which causes the uh, security issues to uh, creep up. All right, so attack surface. Uh, how many of uh, you are from uh, the IoT background, IoT companies or? All right, okay. Okay, so can anybody tell me from a very high level what is the attack surface that you see uh, in IoT? Generally, they tend to use their devices with the default passwords, 
So that's one uh, yes. area that's being exploited. Yes. Secondly, because of the uh, low computation power, they don't use encryption and all those things. So that is again being exploited uh, extensively right. by people. And thirdly, um, most of them are kept directly on the internet and they're not uh, behind any uh, secured environment. So that again exposing them uh, to a great extent. So these three things are majorly uh, contributing that people are um, attacking these. All right. Okay. Yeah, you, you've uh, gone deep deep into it. So from a very high level view, I, I see three uh, major attack surface. One is the device, obviously, because it is part of it. This is the driving force of uh, uh, or the actual technology for uh, IoT. So for me, IoT is simple. Anything which can actually create a bridge between the physical world and the virtual world. So any, we've, we've already had a lot of software. You know, We've done uh, analytics. We're doing a lot of stuff on the cloud. But until and unless you get the picture from the real world on what exactly is happening in the real world, translate it onto your uh, analysis, and then provide value to the user. That's what you know, the whole uh, uh, the game changer is as far as you know, IoT is concerned. So from attack surface perspective, device obviously, because this is what is the actual interface to the physical world. This is capturing the data from the physical world or trying to control uh, the physical world. For example, locks or any, anything that you can think of. And then there are uh, uh, standard uh, uh, attack services on the device, depending on the, uh, the computational capability of the device, whether it is running services, whether it's uh, a Linux-like operating system or whether it's like just uh, a real-time OS running bare-bone uh, services. And we'll come into details in <coughs> of each one of them. Next is cloud. So cloud, I think Nick has already spoken uh, uh, about. So I won't go into much detail on the cloud, but cloud plays a very major role in terms of IoT security because this is where uh, all of the user data and the sensor data is. Uh, and given the how the ecosystem of IoT works, if you can manage to own a particular cl cloud instance for a product, you you actually have access to all the deployed uh, IoT sensors if that uh, if the cloud is allowed to talk to uh, the instances. So effectively uh, uh, breaking into one device versus effectively breaking into all the devices uh, 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 through the cloud. So this is one very important aspect that everyone needs to look at when you're implementing uh, uh, IoT. Next is the mobile. Obviously, everything now has uh, a mobile app where the user can actually see the statistics. Uh, whatever uh, analysis happens on the cloud then is pushed to the device where the user can see how much he ran or what happened to his car, where is uh, the car right now, or what is the pressure in the tire, and uh, different things. And then the attack surface is again the same. The communication, storage, uh, OWASP mobile top 10 are, uh, how many of you are aware of OWASP project? OK, so OWASP is a nonprofit organization that uh, uh, comes up with guidelines and uh, uh, top 10, as you can see, top 10 security issues. In They've come up with a top 10 security issue in mobile. They are pretty famous in uh, uh, the uh, OWASP web top 10 is pretty famous. Um, it, they talk, talk about the top 10 attacks that are happening on the web application. And then they have a lot of guidelines on how developers should go about implementing a particular web application or mobile application. And also, they've built uh, uh, good open source tools that you can use for testing and threat modeling of uh, 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 applications. They have also recently come up with the uh, IoT top 10. But it is, it is a good start point, but I don't actually agree uh, to the top 10, uh, because if you look at the top 10, they actually cover all the uh, plethora of uh, security issues that are there. So for example, one of the top 10 sa ten says uh, uh, web secure, uh, uh, insecure web interface, which means uh, mo uh, web top 10 plus all the web security issues that are there in the world. But it's an ongoing uh, uh, effort. All right, so problem statement, these are the common things that we see in the implementation. One is uh, uh, hard-coded sensitive information. This alone has allowed us to own uh, the mobile applications as well as uh, uh, the sensors uh, for, for, uh, for the products that we uh, have tested. Uh, authentication with the device and the cloud. Cloud, to an extent, 
because there are uh, standard APIs, because uh, there is standardization in web, so you have uh, standardized authentication from the mobile to the cloud. But when it comes to device, then it becomes you know, a little dicey because uh, it will depend on the protocol that you're implementing, uh, whether you have encryption or not, and so uh, a lot of. Uh, so this is one thing that we see very common. Uh, either the communication uh, goes in plain text, uh, even if the authentication is implemented or the authentication is not implemented at all. So some of the startups that we spoke to, they were not aware that you need to actually do authentication because their, uh, their response was, this is an internal network, so why do we need to take care about uh, security? That's the whole point. Yeah. Firmware security. Uh, not many people take care of, the, this is your IP. Right? Your firmware is your IP that is going to go into the sensor. And uh, on a typical uh, update, a typical update mechanism does not take care of encryption of the firmware because most of the jewels for hackers lie in uh, firmware. So the first uh, thing then we, when we start to uh, do penetration testing on uh, a sensor, our uh, first thing that we need to look at is do we have access to the firmware? Once we have access to the firmware, then we go ahead and extract or reverse engineer the firmware to look at the business logic of the device and then think of uh, ways of bypassing uh, the functionality of the sensor, including authentication as well. Reinventing the wheel. Uh, this, again, uh, this comes from the confusion from protocols. When people get tired of looking at too many protocols, they say, see, uh, this is a very simple thing that we are doing. All we are doing is the, the mobile is sending a command to uh, the sensor. The sensor in, is doing its job and responding back to the mobile. Why do we need to use you know, complex protocols? Or why, for that matter, why even HTTP? So let's go ahead and do uh, a simple uh, uh, JSON uh, uh, command or a simple uh, string that represents the command, subcommand, the data that you pass with it. Uh, the problem with that is uh, it's fine if you do uh, the communication using your custom protocol. A, is going to take you a lot of time to implement that. B, and if you try to put your head in how do we go about uh, encrypting that particular communication, then you would come up with let's do it this way so that you know even if the data is on the wire, nobody would understand uh, what's happening. Let's just do XOR, let's just do this, so, which is very, uh, which is not a good thing to uh, do. If you have a standard protocol to do a, do a job, if you have a standard encryption mechanism that does your job, use that. Don't reinvent the wheel. Privacy issues, yes, because the whole uh, user data uh, within the sensor actually goes to the cloud, via the cloud, back to the user, or directly to the user on the mobile. This is one thing that uh, uh, some people forget to take care of. So you may store that data in plain text, uh, thinking that, OK, this is in binary state, so how would somebody be actually make sense of it? You know, that's the hacker's job. That's what they do day in and day out. They're going to reverse engineer whatever data is there. Uh, uh, they're going to analyze the behavior of the execution of the sensor and then try to reverse engineer whatever data is being communicating or what data is exactly being stored on uh, your memory chips of the sensors. Software security issues, again, mobile, cloud, uh, standard services implementation. Hardware security issues, yes. So same as software security issues, uh, the platform that you procure from um, uh, hardware vendors or manufacturers we have a tendency to blindly trust that, okay, if we are getting the hardware, uh, it is secure enough. That's the same problem that happened in the early 90s when we were talking about software security. There was a blind trust, trust in terms of vendors providing a particular so uh, software. You as uh, the implementer of the solution need to take care and make sure that you procure the best suited hardware which provides enough security so that your data or your uh, intellectual property cannot be extracted from it or cannot, people cannot bypass it. And we'll come to specific some of the uh, uh, issues that are there in the hardware as well. So we'll start with one. There was a smart camera that we analyzed, and uh, this was the mobile application. So we just de decompiled the mobile application, and we 
uh, analyze the application and quickly we found out that it ha had a default uh, uh, credentials for the cloud. Now having default credentials uh, for a product is okay uh, where you force the user to change the credentials. But having default credentials or uh, sensitive API keys hard-coded within the application or uh, within the device which the user does not have any control to is uh, uh, bad. So this is, this is a smart plug. We procured it from AliExpress. I think this is a known company in China that makes this uh, smart plug. Uh, uh, pretty standard. Uh, you can add uh, these smart plugs, smart switches to, a mobile, to your mobile app. So they also have a mobile app. You can configure, uh, provision the uh, smart plug, and then uh, whenever you want to switch it on, you can switch it on, set a timer, do whatever you want to do. Now, when we started analyzing it, we looked at the communication happening between the mobile and uh, uh, the smart plug. And we figured out that they were uh, implementing encryption. So now means that they're at least doing some uh, sort of a security so that uh, a third party or an attacker within the same network cannot actually directly control uh, the smart plug. Things changed when we uh, reverse engineer the application. Uh, we decompiled the application, we looked at the Java code and uh, uh, found out that the communication is UDP broadcast, which means the mobile will broadcast uh, the command to the network and only the device will respond. That's fine. And then there was an encode function being used within the Java application, which actually turned out to be native C uh, function. So this uh, application was bundled with a C library, uh, ARM C library obviously, and uh, the encoding and decoding logic was implemented within the C library. So our next target was the C library. We quickly disassembled it, looked at, just traced the function, and uh, I don't know if you can see it. This was the, the first line is, was the Java function, which uh, calls an encrypt data function. We looked at the encrypt data function, which actually calls AES uh, uh, function. So we came to know that it's using AES uh, encryption. And uh, there's a function call called AES set key, which means they're trying to set the key for uh, encryption and decryption. So our next target was to look at where the key is coming from. And fortunately enough, the key was hard-coded within the library itself. Uh, in, in the end, you can see that's the AES key. It was a 256-bit key. It didn't take us more than two, three hours to figure out uh, the whole, uh, the number of bits of encryption uh, and uh, the key itself. And when we had the key, then we went ahead and decrypted the communication and found out that they were using uh, custom communication, obviously. Uh, this was a percentage delimited uh, uh, message where you had the source device type, the MAC address of the target device, uh, password if you set a password on the device, and the command, command like switch on, switch off. Uh, so the phone would send a command to the device. The device would send a random uh, ID to the phone and the phone would confirm that random ID and then the uh, smart plug would switch on or uh, switch off. So they had implemented a lot of things. They, uh, the whole uh, four-way communication takes care of uh, replay attacks. So anybody on the network uh, captures this packet cannot replay it and control the smart plug. But, uh, but there was only one problem. The, the key was hard-coded within the library and the, this key because it is hard-coded in the library, it means that it is also hard-coded within the plug, which means that every plug that they uh, manufacture will have the same key. So given one key, now you can uh, compromise any smart plug that is there on uh, the network. And the smart plug was listening on a non-standard port 27,431 something. All right. Next, come. Uh, let, let's talk about authentication. Uh, this becomes important when we are talking about non-TCP uh, uh, IP uh, sensors. So when you have radio sensors like BLE, ZigBee, uh, or a custom radio protocol. Again, we see some people uh, implementing custom radio protocols for small sensors because uh, of uh, the cost, uh, uh, cost uh, for procuring uh, ZigBee chips or BLE chips or whatever. That's again a bad idea. So having it in radio doesn't mean that you know nobody can uh, understand it. All you need to do is just uh, analyze the radio traffic, reverse engineer the traffic, and you have you now have uh, the communication that is happening between the uh, the sensor, the gateway. 
all right. So for BLE, uh, or even in general, like protocols like COOP, MQTT, we see a lot of times that once the device is provisioned, the provisioning itself right now is pretty unsecure. So the prov provisioning usually happens on plain text. So your Wi-Fi password, your credentials, everything go in uh, plain text uh, on Wi-Fi. And then when we talk about authentication, the mobile device actually usually will not have any authentication with the sensor, which is a bad thing. Next is uh, firmware encryption. So even sometimes, for, again, for uh, radio-based uh, devices, the mobile or the gateway may become the, uh, the, uh, the center point where it can distribute uh, the firmware update to the sensor. And uh, time and again, we have seen that uh, uh, what uh, vendors would implement is that the, uh, the firmware update comes from the cloud, uh, encrypted, uh, TLS, and as soon as it lands on the uh, mobile, it creates uh, temporary storage and decrypts the firmware, and then re-encrypts the firmware and sends it to uh, the sensor based on the protocol that uh, the sensor and the mobile communicate on. So the moment you uh, decrypt it on the mobile, even uh, temporarily, the attackers still have access to the firmware. So now they can uh, get a copy of it and reverse engineer that. This is, again, pretty common. So you decrypt that mobile and then push forward uh, over uh, uh, plain text to the sensor. This is the worst uh, situation where the firmware is not encrypted at all. For example, most of the routers that used to be there uh, the firmware is there uh, unencrypted. So you can just download the uh, firmware. And for a lot of uh, uh, expensive equipment as well, like healthcare equipment, you would find uh, uh, the, uh, the, the firmware sitting on the cloud. And you can just download it and reverse engineer and find vulnerabilities without even going ahead and buying the particular product. So you don't, if, if it's like 100,000 uh, USD, you just get uh, the firmware from somewhere, analyze it, and uh, uh, find the vulnerabilities within the product without even touching or buying the product. All right. Fitbit. How many of you use health bands? Yeah. So this is one of the, uh, the, the issues with cloud. Uh, not a major compromise, but I saw this in one of the presentations in uh, uh, Hack in Paris, I think the researcher's name was Axel. She works for Fortinet. Uh, I don't know if she found it or who found it, but yeah. So Fitbit somehow manages to uh, have your sexual activity statistics. I, I, I'm still amazed at how they're able to do it when the band is actually here. But anyways, so that was uh, uh, pushed onto the cloud and a quick uh, uh, Google search for the user will give you the sexual stats and all the stats uh, for the user. Now, everything is fine. Uh, the, uh, the Fitbit implementation of security over BLE is pretty good now. I mean, they've, uh, they've had their bad time. They've implemented uh, good security measures. But the problem is, even if they have uh, good security measures over BLE, sensor is pretty secure, mobile app is good. But if you have something like this on the cloud, where everybody has access to your data, um, there's no point of having just you know, uh, BLE security. Uh, it's useless now. All right, so let's now come to the, the hardware part. So hardware, or uh, uh, as we see it, also comes with uh, different debug ports. Uh, some, some of them are typically used by the developers for tr troubleshooting. Some of them are used by support staff. Uh, UART is pretty common, where uh, uh, most of the routers use uh, UART. Uh, this basically gives you access to a console, usually or log messages running on the device. So the trick here is to identify uh, where the UART port is on the device, which is not a pretty dif difficult task. I mean, it's not impossible to uh, identify. So this is basically uh, serial communication between uh, two devices, either on the same board or on uh, different boards. For example, your main uh, uh, microcontroller talking to the front end or the LCD screen over uh, UART. So there are different protocols that they can use. UART is one of them. And uh, console access for troubleshooting is pretty common. Uh, developers typically use UART on the device and uh, tie it directly to uh, the shell on the device. At times, they would implement their own custom shell where you get access to their uh, uh, shell. 
All right, so identifying this on the board is, uh, uh, again, you, all you need is just uh, multimeter and uh, the data sheet of uh, the microcontroller that is used on the sensor. Once you have that, you quickly do scanning. Uh, if you remember your scanning days, you know, network scanning is pretty much similar to that. So you do hit and trial on which could be uh, a potential uh, UART port or UART pin on the device. All you need for UART uh, uh, port identification is uh, the transmit line, the receive line, a ground line, which is 100% times there on the board, and uh, a voltage line. Now you do typically, typically don't need the voltage if the board is already powered on. So for example, Netgear Push to TV uh, board has a UART where you can get access to uh, the shell. And so most of times when we also do, uh, so uh, we did uh, uh, the research on the smart camera where we looked at the hard-coded uh, uh, credentials. That's a Taiwanese-based uh, uh, product. They also had uh, uh, UART open and the UART was actually directly tied into a root shell. So the moment you find out UART, you directly get access to root shell onto the sensor, which on, on, onto the camera, which means now you have the, uh, even th even if you don't have the firmware for that device, now you have access to the real-time firmware with running binaries on, onto the system. JTAG, Joint Test Action Group. This was, uh, uh, this was formed in 1985. So this is basically a protocol to test the microcontroller and uh, chained microcontrollers and memory chips onto the board. So the basic idea why this was created was that uh, post-production testing for hardware was a little challenge because you know everyone would have their own design for the board. So once you put all the chips in, how do you test it? And then you had like those pins where you can test whether the microcontroller is working, everything is fine or not, but they were pretty costly. So then they came up with this particular protocol which the microcontroller itself can implement. All you need to do is just communicate and see whether all the pins of microcontroller are working fine, uh, whether the connected uh, chips with the microcontroller on the line are working fine or not. Turns out that uh, they implemented too much in J JTAG protocol. So now what happens is you can actually get real-time control onto the microcontroller. So you can start debugging the code that is running onto the microcontroller. So if it's, for example, if it's Linux, you can get access to the Linux kernel code that is running. Or if it's a real-time OS, you get access to real-time uh, OS running on the device, which means if you are not able to bypass authentication in any case on the device, you just uh, bypass it within the code. So when you log in to the device, uh, hook into the JTAG uh, uh, port onto the device, and uh, nullify the authentication uh, instructions, just bypass those instructions and go to the uh, next instruction. Again, all, all, you also just need to scan. So you need to scan and identify where the JTAG port is onto the device. Again, you need my, uh, multimeter. You need uh, the data sheet of the microcontroller if you have or if you don't have. You go ahead and just uh, blindly test it. And there are other hardware tools as well which will assist you to. So there are scanners available which will scan for JTAG ports on the board. So all the pins that you see on the board, for example, these pins, you just blindly connect them and let the scanner scan for uh, a potential uh, JTAG port. It basically needs uh, four to five pins. And typically, you would find uh, uh, a JTAG port on uh, a motherboard uh, with a combination of seven pins, 14 pins, uh, things like that. So TDI. TDO, NTRST, TMS, TCK, they are all uh, JTAG pins. Yeah, so I, uh, some other examples of uh, innovation in hiding or keeping uh, JTAG ports. So if you, uh, sometimes what the vendors would do is expose the, uh, the JTAG port uh, for, again, for troubleshooting. So once, uh, typically for small devices like these, you can't open them once, uh, once you, uh, manufacture them, it's impossible to open it. So they will typically es expose uh, JTAG interface to troubleshoot or uh, uh, find any faults in the device, which is what the hackers also use to extract the firmware. Yeah. All right. 
So controlling the microcontroller that we have already seen. Uh, extracting uploading firmware. So JTAG also gives you read and write access onto uh, the microcontroller and uh, the memory. So you can not only interact with the running microcontroller, but you can also read memory from the microcontroller flash, for example, or an external flash if it is connected to the microcontroller somehow. So if you can read flash, most of the times what will happen is your firmware uh, is sitting in the uh, flash memory. So if you're not able to get it from the cloud, you directly go ahead and get it from the microcontroller itself. Uh, other stuff, yeah, so you have different uh, protocols like uh, I2C, uh, SPI, they are also used uh, for communication. So typically you would see them again uh, within uh, LCD screen and the, uh, and the main board. Or uh, uh, if you use uh, EEPROM chips or flash chips, they would typically speak uh, I2C protocol and SPI protocol. So what you do is desolder that particular flash chip and uh, uh, use a particular hardware reader. We also have come up with a reader. Uh, and there are, uh, again, open source tools available that will allow you to read or extract the data from the flash chip. So these are, these are the common things that you would think that my password or my key stays in the flash memory. And it is secure because no, who's going to access it? The point is, if it's uh, in plain text, it's not difficult to go ahead and extract and read the contents of the flash memory. And then <coughs> USB, uh, SD card, typically some of the uh, vendors would use external storage or external communication uh, via USB. External storage becomes uh, very interesting because then you can do a lot of attacks on uh, the operating system that is there. Because uh, again, uh, the implementation that reads the SD card or uh, USB storage would typically blindly trust the data that it's reading from the, uh, the storage. Now, what if you change the data on the SD card? What happens then? So there was one product that we uh, tested. It was pretty secure. They had taken all measures of security. There was no access onto the device. JTAG was closed. Everything was closed. The cloud was pretty secure. They had uh, client certificates communicating with the cloud. Uh, we couldn't get in. So on the last day, all we did was we figured out they had uh, like uh, a device uh, that you can attach to uh, the main, uh, it, it, it was a cooking machine. So there was like a small circular device that you would attach and suddenly the cooking machine would be, and it would enable the cooking machine to talk to the cloud. So the OS and everything reside, uh, was in the cooking machine, but this particular uh, uh, device, uh, had this functionality of making it smart, so enabling communication where you can download a lot of stuff and do a lot of things. Uh, when we opened the, uh, the small device, it was pretty fancy, uh, had a magnet and all. We found out that uh, inside it was just uh, USB storage plus uh, Wi-Fi uh, chip. So we extracted the contents of uh, the USB storage. And there were two partitions. We figured out that one of the partition was there was there was a tar file, uh, compressed tar file, which had uh, the default uh, database for uh, the device. So if anything uh, is corrupted onto the device, they will roll back and extract the star and uh, roll back to the default factory default uh, stage. So all we did was we pushed in etc shadow file and etc password file with no password for root user. They had telnet running. And <clears throat> fortunately enough, the program within the device that was uh, extracting the tar file was a custom program that was using tar libraries to extract it. Now, the problem here was that it did not look at where the file has to be extracted. So it blindly took the tar file and extracted it onto the USB storage. The problem was that we had appended uh, slash etc slash shadow and slash etc slash uh, password. So what happened was the original shadow and password file got overwritten, and uh, we get we got direct access through Telnet because there was no uh, root password on onto the device. All right. So trends and issues. This is uh, what I think is going to uh, uh, happen in the future. Yeah. So the first one is IoT hacking is not only about hardware hacking because every particular piece, uh, whether you talk about mobile, whether you talk about cloud has its uh, importance. So we cannot forget the importance of the cloud because that is where uh, the, uh, the user data lies. For a vendor to uh, 
uh, where your cloud is hacked is it's really bad because then a your data is leaked b the attackers can actually control all the deployed sensors that are there around the world and obviously yeah hardware is the piece where you can find interesting information from the sensors all right second is uh, attacking cloud via rogue sensors. So now, uh, typically cloud applications, what they will do is trust data coming in from the sensors because it may not be HTTP, it may be some proprietary uh, protocol, as I think uh, some of you as well mentioned. So when there is custom protocol, you may tend to, uh, the developers may tend to trust the data coming in from the sensor. So if it's MQTT, or if it's uh, <coughs> a co-op, or if it's, uh, I don't know, Modbus or whatever, and you would not do any kind of filtering here. So this is what I think we are going to see where people are going to first uh, uh, reverse engineer the sensors and then implant rogue sensors in a network that can go ahead and attack the cloud and see if you can get remote code execution onto the cloud from, the, from a valid network but a rogue uh, uh, sensor. And this is going to cause a lot of problems. I think issues we've pretty much uh, covered, all of them. All right, so yeah. So when we started uh, looking at IoT security testing, we were pretty excited. That's what happens with uh, uh, even vendors when they start to look at uh, IoT security testing. And so you say, you know, we are all geared up. We know how security works, and we know the <coughs> common pitfalls that are there for you know uh, products when you implement. Uh, IOT. So you're pretty happy. You say, I'm going to, yeah, you know, uh, kick the product's ass and, you know, do a fine job. But when you start testing, this is what happens. You, you look at a particular sensor that is deployed that does smart metering and that does, you know, temperature sensing and a lot of stuff that talks custom radio protocol. And then you end up buying uh, thousands of uh, hardware tools to analyze, to only analyze. Uh, the communication, uh, analyze the data that is there on the uh, on the storage, and typically some of those devices or tools may not be used for your next uh, assessment because the product itself would be totally different. So what do you do with them? Yeah. So too many interfaces, too many tools. So this is where we started thinking of you know how can we have something where the uh, the lead time to learning as well as uh, uh, automation is 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 decreased. So you can basically automate all the boring parts of the testing, and just get the meat of the communication and the data, and then uh, and then give it to your uh, researchers to analyze and find out uh, flaws within the either the communication or the firmware, whatever you have. So for mobile, we released. Uh, 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 an app called Diva Android. Uh, you can just search for Diva Android Security. It is there on GitHub. Uh, this is this app basically gamifies the the real world vulnerabilities that are there on mobile. So you can play along, look at the source code, and then uh, uh, make sure that you don't make the same mistakes in your uh, mobile apps. Uh, for IoT, we implemented a vulnerable board. So this board typically implements all the vulnerabilities that we have mentioned where you can go ahead and so it runs uh, uh, it runs two UART uh, ports where one of the port is for all the challenges where you can look at uh, analyzing the communication between uh, the, uh, the chip and the microcontroller, uh, try to reverse engineer whether the password is being sent or whether the key is being sent or what kind of communication is happening when you're triggering a certain action onto uh, the sensor. And then for finally we also have come up with an open source uh, solution. This, the, the plan with this is that you can actually integrate the whole uh, IoT security testing into one set of a framework. And then based on your requirements, you can keep on adding test cases uh, for your uh, product. Yeah, so yeah, so this is Diva. This is Diva IoT board. I have a couple of Diva IoT boards. If you're interested, I can just show it to you. I will obviously not give it to you, but I can show it to you. Uh, how how do you go about using it? Or you can attend my training, and there I can explain how do you use uh, the tool and how do you basically exploit the devices. 
uh, yeah, so then finally we came up with this. Uh, the tool is called Exploity. It's there on my uh, Bitbucket uh, repository. So the design goals were sim uh, were simple to use, extendable, because I don't want to create another tool, you know, where uh, the uh, the vendors have depend uh, depend uh, dependency on uh, me or on the company. Uh, you can go ahead, take the tool, make your threat modeling, do your threat modeling, write your own test case as you please. I will give you all the tools that are required uh, for using this. For example, for uh, radio-based communication, for hardware an analysis, you can purchase my tools or any uh, anybody else's tools. But for software uh, part of it, you will have one simple interface where you can add your own test cases, use the, uh, the default uh, test cases that are there. So again, the architecture is pretty simple. I'll not go into deep. You have the core framework, which will implement all the protocols and uh, the interfaces for test cases. Then you have the plugin modules, where you will have uh, open source plugins. Plus, you can contribute to new plugins, and you can use your own. You can create your own plugins and use it within your uh, company. And then you have a console. So going forward, I think another uh, year or so, we're going to come up with a pro version of this, which will uh, the primary focus of that would be to do smart infrastructure uh, security assessment, where you have plethora of uh, IoT deployed, and you go ahead and uh, scan and find out the vulnerabilities within the smart infrastructure. Yeah, so the currently we have a couple of MQTT test cases for analysis, COPE test cases. We have a board scan test case. So uh, when you do uh, uh, scanning for UART port on the device, the next uh, step is to identify the border rate of the UART communication, because it's not published anywhere. So what this test case will uh, help you do is uh, connect to the UART of the board and just run it, and it will scan for valid uh, board rates on the device. And whichever matches, uh, it shows you uh, uh, the, uh, the, the correct board rate. Basic BLE support for communicating with BLE sensors and exploit for uh, the smart plug. So current hardware, we have come up with the first version. We call it Exploit Nano. This will allow you, so this will basically create a bridge between your PC and the hardware uh, target hardware board, where you can talk JTAG, you can talk UART, you can talk SPI, you can talk uh, uh, I2C. You can use any open source software at the back end or proprietary for that matter. All it gives you is direct access to the hardware, where you can extract the data. And this is going to be in production by hopefully by uh, next month or January uh, 2018. All right, so yeah, so that's the roadmap. We're going to also implement uh, Zigbee, LoRa, and other uh, uh, radio protocol analysis within the product. Firmware analysis uh, for non standard firmwares or non Linux uh, firmware, and obviously a lot of uh, other IoT based exploits. All right, so I don't think we have time for uh, demos, but I could have shown you some of uh, the demos. Anyway, so you can do COPE uh, reconnaissance, find out the services that are running on a particular uh, COPE sensor, and try and ping each of the service to see if you can uh, uh, trigger any action or basically control the COPE uh, sensor. Next is we figured out uh, uh, with a very famous MQTT library, uh, open source library, that uh, you can actually go ahead and do a denial of service if there is uh, an MQTT-based network anywhere. You can go ahead and do a denial of service by just using known uh, client IDs. So the way MQTT works is with identifying uh, sensors is with uh, client IDs and obviously username and uh, password, which is mostly never used. But if you have uh, this kind of a network, all you need to do is just brute force over the client IDs and all the clients would be disconnected. Malicious payload. All right, so this, I think I can quickly do a demo here. So this is the, the, the trend that I'm talking about is when you have a sensor sending in uh, non-standard or non-IT uh, uh, protocol or specific to IoT protocol, uh, when the cloud application would typically trust it, then you can go ahead and send anything and see based on the behavior uh, of the application, whether the data is going in the database, whether the data is being reflected onto the screen or whatever, whether you can get remote code execution and whatnot. So I'm just going to check if things are running fine. 
All right, let's quickly just run through this. This is the, uh, the UI of the pool. So I'm just sending uh, a, a request to a COP server. This is a development COP server, californium.eclipse.org. This is the interesting part. This basically is a standard which says any request coming to this, the, uh, the server has to publish or respond with a list of known uh, services or APIs or paths that are there on the server. So once I have this, uh, I can go ahead and look at each one of the paths here and uh, go and try and poke my nose into the, these URLs and see if I can uh, upload anything or if I can control or change the behavior of uh, the sensor. All right, let's go to, yeah, so I have just an example. Just to make it fancy, I kept the in engine room image anyway. So this basically is like an application that monitors uh, the, the temperature onto uh, the sensor. Uh, you can do pretty much anything. My example would be a cross-site scripting attack here where So I'm going to send uh, uh, the temperature from the sensor. This is going to wait for the temperature from the sensor. As soon as I send it, uh, it will give me the temperature. Okay, so the logged in administrator can see, okay, the temperature is 22.5 and everything is fine. Uh, but assuming that uh, there is no filtering at the cloud, cloud end on what data is coming in from uh, the sensor, uh, let's see what you can do with so instead of that, let me just send uh, uh, an HTML or a JavaScript to pop up uh, browser. So it comes in, uh, user sees it, and gets executed. All right, yeah, I think that's about it. There are a lot of images that are used. And I, uh, I think uh, if we have, do we have time? Like five minutes, yeah? So I would like my colleague here to just give you a brief about uh, what Null Community is. In case you're interested, we have chapters in all uh, major cities in India, as well as uh, in Singapore, uh, Dubai, and Amsterdam. And uh, you don't have to register for anything. All you need to do is just join the mailing list whenever there is, uh, whenever there is a meeting, you can uh, look at the meeting and you know, just, just show up in the meeting, talk to fellow security researchers. Yeah. And then we can take on questions if you have any. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, Asim, Nick, all of these guys have talked a lot about a lot of new things, IoT, cloud, mobile. And uh, just a little background before give, going into what we do. So learning all of these is sometimes an overload, right? Everyone would agree with that. And we all are getting older and older every day. It's, it's difficult. And it's boring as well sometimes. So in order to make that fun and in order to have a community around wherein we have real people, uh, real experiences, real uh, issues, real cases, wherein we could discuss that. We came up with this community thing. So the name is Null. Uh, so it, the idea was to share knowledge in the area of information security community, uh, promote and advance security research, make InfoSec learning fun. So all what we do is just learn and learn. Okay, so we have chapters across uh, India we have chapters in Singapore, Amsterdam, and Dubai, as Asim said, and everything we do is free and open to all. Okay, so there is uh, not a single penny which is involved anywhere. Uh, we just uh, do events, uh, just one second, okay. We do events, I'll talk about the format of events that we do, format of workshops, format of uh, different kinds of learning uh, formats that we have. So yeah, before doing that, we are non-profit, we are registered non-profit society, and I like I mentioned, everything in Null is free and open. Uh, there's no place for hate speech, etc. So the first thing that we do is we meet every month. So the key to learn and the key to kind of create a community is to meet regularly, okay? So we meet at a place, companies, uh, 
organizations, universities. Uh, these are places where we meet. Uh, people are generous enough to give us free places to host our meetups. Uh, we meet there, we talk about security, we talk about new things that are coming up. We share that knowledge and everyone goes happy. Okay. We do hands-on workshops. You know trainings these days. Uh, it's difficult to actually get access to uh, niche trainings. And once we get access, it's sometimes not affordable for everyone. So in order to make that affordable, we came up with these three uh, workshop or three hands-on training formats. And one is the, uh, we call it Hamla, as everyone would know, the Hindi name for offensive things. Defensive uh, things that we do is Bachav, again the Hindi name. And then there are people who come up and say that, okay, I'm new to security or I have some basic skills that are lacking and I want to bridge that. Okay, for example, Linux. Okay, so for when, when you want to enter into InfoSec, you want to learn Linux first. Okay, you want to learn some scripting, Python, etc. For that, we have this workshop format and we do it free every time. Okay, so there are people, so every, it's volunteer driven. People uh, volunteer themselves, they come up and volunteer for doing these workshops. These are generally full day workshops, free of cost. Uh, the only prerequisite that we ask for is you participate. Okay, based on your past participation, we kind of restrict the uh, participation into these workshops. All that we do is uh, here at null.co.in. This is the simple website. You don't need to remember anything when you go out. Just remember this website, go there, you'll find every detail. Uh, all the chapters that we have, and you can see we've got around uh, more than 7,000 registered folks there. All they turn up at different chapters, they meet every month, they kind of talk about security, they, they share their knowledge, they learn as well and they go home. Then we have this uh, null mailing list. For people who don't make it to uh, these meetups or sometimes you've got some questions which you really want to get answered immediately. We've got this mailing list. Again, more than 6,000 registered folks. You go there, ask your bit. It's technical completely. You ask your things. Someone would be there at some part of the world who will be ready to assist you or who has a solution to your problem. If not solution, he can probably or she can probably direct you to the right place. This is again, uh, if you go to null.co.in, there is a section called forum. If you go there, you can be directed to this null mailing list. Then this is another initiative that we got. So we've got a lot of uh, like job portals around, but there is no dedicated security job portal. Okay, It's free. It's free for both employers and for people looking out for jobs. So for example, a company has five different security job openings and they want to just target the security community, the folks who are working in the security industry. They come here, they post their jobs. People again, they can apply directly from here. It's again community initiative, nothing being charged to no one. And generally we get this question. For example, now you would have this curiosity, how do I become a member of this community? So as it's community, you don't need to do anything Anyone who wants to associate with us, just show up at your local chapter. Just attend the meets, participate, ask questions, learn from them, and maybe sometime in future do give sessions as well. Just some numbers to get an idea what, uh, how or how big we are. So in 2016, we did 150 plus events. More than 250 speakers presented at our events, and more than 4,000 people attended our meetups. These are some ways you can participate, attend meetups in your local chapter, choose a topic, learn it. So for example, when you go out, you want to learn IoT, you go to your local chapter, ask folks there who is into IoT, who wants to learn something more. Can you share some experiences? Can you like give me some materials to learn? Or maybe collaborate with them or do a project with them together. Make friends, okay? It's not only just learning, make friends who are like-minded as well. And while doing all of these, have fun. Current list of chapters, as I mentioned. Uh, generally, uh, right now we're in Delhi, so anyone willing to kind of participate in Delhi, you can contact me directly. For different chapters, you can go to null.co.in and you can find the contact person there. For all chapters, you can reach out to them directly. Otherwise, if you keep a track of the website, uh, every event is notified there. You just show up on that day. You don't have to do anything. Just show up on the day at the place. It's open. And there you go. You get started. These are some links, uh, null.co.in. For any questions, you may probably send an email to info at null.co.in, some social media profiles. And that's it.
nothing more. Okay, that's one. So Asim, you have questions. You got to ask questions. Yeah, any question for this or something that I don't Yeah. Know, and Questions? All right. I'm assuming everyone got it. <laughs> so after, uh, I guess after 30 years, what do you think would uh, ever work? Uh, how how we would be changing our dynamics related to the real time data and uh, you know our uh, day to day maybe devices or something and the future is not dark that's what i can <laughs> say but things are going to uh, change i mean the attacks that you see now the whole dynamics of those attacks are going to change because now they want to focus on sensor i am more worried about the healthcare as well as uh, the industrial uh, or industrial iot because that is very critical I mean, somebody hacks into my temperature sensor and you know, get, shows me the wrong temperature is fine but because uh, i, I but just had told that I mean, nowadays there is a new inventions those inventions are not being taken care about the health hazards yes. of the you know society right now uh, i know mobile radiations are you know, at, at their peak. Yeah, yeah. So, and, yeah, so. And also the, now that, uh, you know, it, protocols can not only carry the, your da data from device to device, but they can carry power as well. Yes, yes. Smart cities and all. Yes, so, so that's what I'm saying. So, so I mean, uh, I don't know where our world is heading. And, uh, and maybe, you know, if uh, some, some uh, terrorist can, uh, you know, or some cyber criminals, wants to blow f whole city or something like that you know using those technologies and you know like yeah. maybe short circuiting the power or something like that so what uh, mechanism are we going to adopt so don't you think that we should have some kind of framework kind of thing where we can we, we just like an international body yes so there, there are up. there are a lot of uh, international bodies so i'll answer your questions in part they are doing their own work one of the challenges I see is that uh, uh, specific, uh, they are domain specific. So healthcare is only talking about healthcare, aviation is talking only about uh, aviation. And the problem is about knowledge there. So if you don't have uh, specific knowledge on uh, hardware or you know, cloud, then you are in a mess. Uh, the other thing about uh, causing uh, damage, uh, sure, that, that I, I won't deny it. That's going to happen. Even with the physical security, you, you've seen planes going and hitting WTC, and I, I, uh, I don't see how that's not possible in the uh, in the virtual world now. Given that there will be more of automation, those so challenges those are going to be there. Those products coming from China, countries like China, where you know you, they can code something in the batteries, even yeah. you know they can drain down your batteries. I wouldn't within, say only China. Within, within, yeah, yeah, everywhere, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> especially our neighbors more. <laughs> Uh, that that is bound to happen so I mean we have to gear up for it uh, it's not going to be like every day a plane is falling because somebody remotely hacked into it but it is going to happen uh, the only thing what we can do from our side is you know come up with these frameworks come up with uh, uh, organizations non-profit organizations that can help solve uh, some of the challenges and as far as environmental issues are concerned Pretty much after five to ten years, you'll see reports coming in from IIT. Will they'll say that you know because electricity is you know carrying uh, carried carries data and people who see that data they you know they go blind after some time. So yeah, that's that's also going to happen. But I'm I'm more worried on the healthcare and industrial uh, IoT than home. How do you how as an organization to start with this cyber physical asset? And on a cyber on a so on a cyber physical asset for a manufacturing company to start. So, and he, the, the, with Industry 4.0, and people are trying to do everything and all with IoT here and there. So, it is extreme, it is difficult for an IT organization to stop that. Yes. And you have to embrace that. But also, while embracing the current technologies which is there, how do you start and how IT should collaborate with business? What What is the starting point? How do you how to drive that in phases? Because it'll it'll happen in, in, in multiple pockets. It's extremely difficult to control that. 
and once it proliferates, it's extremely difficult to stop that be because immediately you will realize value out of it. That if you tell that stop that, if you tell these are the things which can happen, you know, uh, there he may not, you say that you, you come up with a control, but once somebody does, you've got no control uh, in your hand. Yeah. So it, it's already done, executed. You can't revert that, you can't change the sense and yeah. you can't do that. How to start for a cyber physical asset journey? you know, uh, for an organization. If you can put some light on that. Okay, I, I just have one word for that mindset. You just need to have uh, a security mindset for that. If you have that, so from our customers, uh, there are customers who do it for compliance reasons and then there are customers who do it for security reasons. And uh, pretty much uh, customers who do it for security reasons are much more successful. In I won't say that they are 100% secure, nobody can claim that. I think there is no organization that can put a stamp that you're 100% secure. But if you have the mindset for security, then you will pretty much do uh, more than what you have to do for compliance. For example, for compliance, if it's handling, if, uh, if it's handling payments, you would say, oh, I'll comply with PCI. Once I get the stamp, I'm done. Then you're just opening up uh, a door to uh, a lot of problems. So if you have the buy-in, from the top management that look, uh, this is an era where you know incidents can happen anytime. And uh, if we go by compliance, we are limiting our, we are narrow, narrowing down our thoughts. If we want to be safe and secure, if we want to uh, uh, give customers that uh, security, then we need to think how can we build security in our product rather than just getting certification. So you need to have a buy-in from the top management as well. Unless that happens, uh, there are the buy-ins story. are there, but like how, how, because it's not an, it's not a single factory in an organization. Yeah. The 100 factories which is there, located across different kind of in product, different time it was bought. And it was something which was bought 30 years before, something which was bought 20 years before, something we were buying five years, uh, we bought five years before, which is cyber ready server ready machine, yes. something which is 30 years before, we are adding PLCs, cards and all, and converting it to a cyber ready uh, equipment. While you do so, and, and today also that forget the IoT and all, people does not even talk beyond XP, those machines does not even yeah. talk beyond XP. Yeah. Even virtual patching and uh, installing latest antivirus itself is a problem for those machines. With that journey that, you know, the, to, to start that, is there, anywhere that while you buy sensors, you should buy from these certified sensors, which is there in the industry. Okay. Like, okay. That no, if, no. You, if you are starting a journey, you need to do a workshop. Yeah. So is there any specific workshop for business before starting an IoT journey? That he should do a workshop where he should see that before I do an IoT, I have to do an, uh, you know, the, or cyber physical asset if I want to convert my machine to a cyber physical asset. I need to do a 20 uh, and workshop for 16 hours. That should tell me the nitty gritties of these and all. And this is where I should look at and a model. And moment it is, it is each of the component when I'm converting, each will get tested how will get documented. And I should follow those processes and allied technology and partner who will immediately come and integrate as an overall process. Is okay. there any framework which is maturing there for are, there are industry 4.0? There are different frameworks, but not nothing specific to uh, uh, that covers all the in-depth in, in terms of what uh, I mentioned here. So they would talk about having security in, uh, at, a, at, a, at a high level. So how do you go about and implement that becomes a challenge. What you said is that I have implemented somewhere, you will find it out quickly, give me a horror report and you come and go ahead after giving that horror report. With this exercise, you'll be able to submit any time a horror report to me. Yes. Yes. So w what I do, it has been done. Like how do I how do I start? How do I approach? To how do I replicate so that I should not get an horror report okay, like okay. this? Okay. Okay. So yeah. So a little bit of shameless marketing here. Uh, the way we do it is uh, our end uh, product or end delivery is uh, a report, which gives you uh, the criticality of the issue based on your uh, uh, domain. Uh, and uh, recommendations on what you should go about uh, uh, doing or how you should implement it. If the, uh, if the customer is at early stage, then we consult them uh, based on how you should go about your SDLC process and look at uh, 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 specific things where you, if you're going to go ahead with a certain chipset or certain platform, make sure how you're going to implement it and make sure you don't do uh, these kind of things. So do, doing threat modeling for them. 
uh, for something that is already procured, uh, the best bet is to have uh, uh, an assessment or an audit done, where first you identify. It has not been procured. Yeah. How do I approach that? Yeah, so I think the, the best is to not trust uh, anything that you're going to take because and look at what all security features that they're, they're providing and then challenge them in terms of uh, those security features. Is there, is there any standardization being worked out for that? Uh, so in, for, for industrial IoT, I think uh, the NIST has some, then there is a US organization, uh, I forgot the name, and then there is a German organization that uh, they are doing it. My only concern is that nobody is talking about the netigrities. So we are planning to come up with a security testing methodology for IoT regardless of uh, the domain that you are into. But that will not become a standard. It becomes a proprietary sort of a framework. If it's open source, it's not proprietary. No, still, I'll tell you yeah. the example what the gentleman was telling. Exactly, this is the biggest problem in, uh, we do a lot of consulting for industrial IoT. Yeah. And uh, there's a platform guy, whoever is providing solution, we specialize in security, so we also go along. It looks good when somebody is making a presentation, but when you actually implement, then all these questions come up. You know, uh, the OT and IT are separate today. Yeah, yeah. Now you're merging them. Yeah. It becomes extremely challenging for them to implement, even though the values and other things are there. And if you talk to the IoT guys, people who are startups coming up, security is, is the least thing they're bothered. Yes, th that's the challenge, that's what I'm saying. So No, yeah. beca because uh, nobody asks them right questions. When they bring and come and do a demo or proof of concept or value, people are not asking about the security part. If he adds that layer, they think they can put a layer actually, which is not the case. Yeah. I mean, they have to think uh, at the beginning. It's the cost thing. So there has to be some trade-off. Unless there is some standardized thing, even we don't know what kind of questions to ask. Uh, I think the easiest question uh, specific to vendors, I think you can directly ask them is, uh, have you, uh, have you uh, done a penetration testing exercise for your product? Don't ask for certifications, because then they'll give you ICSA certification, this certification, that. Just say, have you done a penetration testing exercise from a third party? Yes or no? If yes, what were the results and how you have implemented security? What were the findings? So then you are testing for their platform at the cloud or whatever the thing? Whatever offering they're giving. So if they're giving, for example, a smart meter, you say, have you done penetration testing for uh, your smart meter before uh, uh, going live? So if they say no, then they're not mature enough. So I think this question you should ask each and every vendor, regardless of whether they have any certification. And who will do penetration testing for them? Specialized companies. guys or yes. people who are traditionally doing for all applications? No, no, no. Specialized, and guys. specialized guys. Specialized who do uh, IoT security. Right. Yeah. So there, 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 there are other companies as well who do IoT security. But I think, yeah, it doesn't make sense for somebody to test uh, a sensor who has been doing uh, web application security the whole of their life. Because uh, the, the, the process and the findings and the attacks are totally different. So somebody who has experience in doing it prior is the right candidate. But from a product company perspective, that's, yeah, that's a very good start point. If you start demanding from the vendors whether they have uh, done penetration testing or security assessment for their product. If they have, what was the outcome and how did they fix the issues? All right then, yeah. thank you.